Kate Bradbury is my special guest today. Um, she, um, for those who don't know who Kate is, and shame on you if you don't, by the way, um, she is an award-winning author. You've written three books, haven't you? I have, yes. And I am the proud owner of one of them, which I want oh. to... Which you haven't signed, actually, so I need to come to Brighton to get that signed. Come to Brighton, yep. Um, and also a journalist. Um, you're passionate about organic, wildlife-friendly gardening, um, and also gardens in a small patch of land in Brighton, which we'll talk about um, anon. And mm. just to give you a bit more information about Kate, for, again, for those who may not necessarily know much about her, um, she edits the wildlife pages of the BBC Garden as well magazine. And you regularly write articles for the Daily and Sunday Telegraph, The Guardian, the Royal Horticultural Society magazine, uh, The Garden, um, BBC Wildlife and BBC Country Farm magazines. Um, in 2015, you became the first butterfly ambassador for butterfly conservation. And you write a quarterly column for its members magazine called Butterfly. Uh, you regularly talk at events and festivals festivals you appear on the radio including BBC Gardeners Question Time and the popular uh, Royal Horticultural Society um, gardening podcast. You also make uh, wildlife gardening videos for gardenersworld.com. You live, you breathe, you exist gardening and is currently transforming a tired north-facing patio garden which I probably think is probably pretty transformed now. Yeah, that's that, yeah, that was a few years ago, but yes, and, <laughs> it's uh, transformed. <laughs> I'm sure it is, and we'll, we'll be hearing about it, and you uh, obviously attract a, a wealth of animals to your garden. Um, originally, you grew up in Brighton, Birmingham even. Sorry. Birmingham, Birmingham, you yes. Started, you started gardening at the age of three. Tell us about very, it. Very, very small. Um, oh, I don't know, we just had a garden. We just had a garden and my mum just used to throw me and my sister out into the garden. And um, yeah, we just started. My dad had a big vegetable patch at the back of the garden. And my mum did all the ornamental stuff sort of towards the front and I just got hooked from a very early age. Um, that's in my blood, I suppose. Yeah, that's incredible because, you know, I don't know many people who started gardening from that age, really, because most people I know kind of got into it later on once they sort of learnt about it academically. Um, which is yeah. Um, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, it's funny. My sister, my sister's only two years younger and she didn't pick it up at all. She absolutely hates it. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that was all about. But well, in America, they often say, you know, for example, if you're interested in birds, they say, what was your seed? What was your, mm. um, what was your seed moment? What was your spark bird, as it were? So I suppose in the gardening terms, what was your seed? Um, I, think, I think it was just a, a, a desire to grow food. I was about 11 and um, I'd always sort of been gardening and sort of mucking around in the garden, but didn't really know what I was doing. And then um, when I was 11, I begged mum to let me have a vegetable patch. So I had this little vegetable patch um, in the back garden and, um, and grew really bad carrots and potatoes and I had a compost heap. I just basically spent most of my time just doing the compost heap, really. Um, beans. And yeah, I suppose that was it, really. That was my seed. Um, Do you, to be a gardener, I mean, I'm terrible. When I say terrible, I, I don't have a garden. And when I did have a garden, when I used to live at my mum's house when I was a kid, I used to use the garden purely as a, as a wildlife refuge, which I suppose mm. in a way works hand in hand. Because as a kid, I remember bringing home seeds and stuff from my primary school to plant in my garden. I didn't know what I was planting, but I just knew that it attracted insects. So do you, can, can anyone, I know it's a bit of a silly question, but can anyone actually just become a gardener or garden their garden without having to have any prior knowledge of particular species and stuff like that and how to grow things? Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't think you need to know anything, really. I mean, if, you know, I think, um, like, as a wildlife gardener, I, I, I kind of bridge two um, quite separate um, uh, interests really so there's the wildlife element and then there's the gardening element and sometimes those things can can contradict 
you know, if you want a really love, if you're all the wildlife to come to your garden, then not really doing anything at all is probably the best thing to do and just have the grass to grow long and have the shrubs get really big and unruly and, and you know, let trees self seed in and stuff. I mean, that's, that's kind of the best way to bring the wildlife in is to actually not do anything at all. Um, but then, you know, from, from the gardening perspective, you know, you can tweak things and control things. Gardening really is all about control and it's about art and it's about planting things to look nice and, and you know and then obviously with the wildlife gardening interest you can bring in specific plants that um, attract loads of insects. Um, so if you've got absolutely no gardening skills at all and you just want wildlife to come in then, then you don't really need to do anything at all but if you want to have a stab at it then you know there are some things you can plant and I think the thing about plants is that most things want to grow so if you plant them and they die some do i mean you know um you just plant more and you just see what works and it's just trial and error um do you do you feel utter horror when you go to people's gardens like people's houses so, you know i remember once going to some party and i was in the garden in the barbecue and someone was saying it's not in the barbecue having a barbecue by the way <laughs> and someone was talking to me about birds saying that there's a lack of birds i said well you know people put in sterile fencing, they put patio across all their garden, and if there's any green, it's Fake grass. Astroturf, it's astroturf, and it's yeah. ornamental flora that doesn't attract anything. No wonder you don't attract birds. And I looked around and I was actually describing this garden. <laughs> do, you, do you feel that as well? Do you feel that urge to sort of tell people, come on, wake up? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, both of my neighbours, um, one neighbour's got, um, they've got AstroTurf and then the other neighbour's got paved garden. Um, and it is just, it is really soul destroying. Um, and I think when, when friends do it as well, when friends say, oh, we're getting, you know, we're getting this done and making it nice and low maintenance. And yeah, a little bit of me dies, but also lots of people are doing the reverse. And I, I try to, I try to focus on that really. Otherwise, I'd just be really depressed all the time. <laughs> when did you make the crossover from being, uh, for want of a better word, amateur to a, a pro? I don't know if I, I don't know if I ever did. I mean, I just, I don't know. Um, uh, I did an RHS qualification about 15 years ago, something like that. So, I mean, I suppose that gave me a bit of a, a bit of a qualification um but i don't know I've, I've just always been writing about it i've just written about what i love and, and my passion and and then um i got really obsessed with bees because um so oh years ago now um my um ex who i was going out with at the time um her housemate had thrown an old duvet into the backyard and a bumblebee a red-tailed bumblebee had made a nest in it and um and the neighbors complained obviously and um, the landlord phoned up and said, if you don't get rid of these bees, I will. So I sort of looked on how to move a bumblebee nest um, and found Bumblebee Conservation Trust and um, this guy, Ben, um, told me how to move the bumblebee nest. And, put, and you know, anyway, boxed it up, took it in the middle of the night to my allotment um, and, uh, and then spent the rest of the summer watching these bumblebees on the allotment and not really doing much work on the allotment at all and um, fell in love with them and just completely fell in love with them and, and from that point what I was writing I tried to get bumblebees into everything I tried to write about bumblebees in every every feature all the magazines I was like oh, I want to write about bumblebees um, and then and then because of that then um, when I got a job at Garden as well magazine then they made me their wildlife editor and it just sort of spiraled really um, and I think, yeah, I just, I just, the knowledge just grew and, and the, the passion just grew and I bought all the books and I, yeah, found that stuff I was doing worked and. Yeah. Cause you, you obviously wrote, this is one of your three books and there's a nice bumble yes. smack in the middle of it. And yes. for those who may not have come across uh, the bumble flies anyway, which is a great book by the way, it's in my book collection. Um, can you kind of break down what it's about? Cause I thought it was a beautiful book. Because it's obviously mm. talking about your, you know, how you transformed your, I believe, your current garden? No, my previous garden, oh, right. my previous garden. Um, 
what's it about? Um, so I moved to Brighton after um, a big breakup and I bought this little little flat with a little paved, well it wasn't paved, it was decked, this little decked garden. And I just set about sort of just taking up the decking and planting a garden really. Um, and so it's about that transformation, it's about the process and it's about all the wildlife that sort of turned up and it was so quick. So within two months of digging the pond in a very, very central urban area, right by Hove train station, um, I, I had uh, dragonflies breeding in the pond and damselflies. I had sparrows coming in and taking caterpillars off the plants to feed their young. Um, I had loads of, loads of bees um, and other insects. And it was just a really, it was a tiny little garden. It was, it was about, it was about 15 foot, so it was really small. Um, but it, it, yeah, it was, it, was, it was very healing. It was a very good, um, yeah, it was a good project and I got loads of stuff in. And that's what it's about really. It is about, ultimately it's about the paving over of gardens and why we shouldn't be doing it and why we should embrace nature and, and bring more to our, to our back doors. So it doesn't matter how big or small our kingdoms are outside the back of our doors, back of our yeah. houses, you, you can make a wildlife haven out of anything. You can, you can make it out of anything. I mean, I, I've lived on, I lived on the sixth floor of a high rise block of flats in central Manchester and I had green finches and blue tits coming in and feeding. Um, I had ladybirds and aphids. I had, I had aphids laying eggs on my, on my plants or aphids not laying eggs, aphids breeding on my plants and feeding for my plants and ladybirds coming in and laying eggs. And, and so I had a whole life cycle going on, a whole predator prey relationship going on just above the Mancunian way um, in the centre of Manchester. So yeah, I mean, you can do, you can do anything, anything. Just, you just need the plants. Yeah, but it's, it's so important actually. People don't really realise that, you know, even a flower pot on your windowsill, you know, has a biodiversity. Which, yeah. excuse me, which in, in, in the end is actually connected to the Amazon, to the Antarctic, to Congo, to the Arctic. You know, it's, it's, it's all connected. And it's just getting that message across, isn't it? To get people to realise that they too have an element to play in this whole thing playing yeah. out. All of us do. I mean, you know, our gardens take up more land than all of our nature reserves put together in the UK. So if every single one of us planted a tree, I mean, I've planted three trees in my garden, then instantly overnight, you've got a, you've got a, you've got a forest, you've got a woodland, um, you know, and, 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 and on balconies, if every balcony had nectar plants, had caterpillar food plants, had, you know, water, just a little dish of water, then there would just be just, just, you know, I mean, the high rises, there would just be just acres and acres of, of habitat for a variety of different species. And, you know, you're never going to get, really rare sort of UK bat species coming into our towns and cities but you might get some species using our gardens as stepping stones between better habitats and that is really important. I was talking to uh, your well, our friend Joel Ashton on Monday um, yes. and we were talking well, I think I raised a point about um, the places you nurseries you go to and to buy plants for your garden. I, I remember when I was doing some research for my one of my books, I realised that there was like something like fifty five thousand different plants available, and I was thinking, wow, most of them are, can't be native. Mm. Um, there must be a lot of um, you know alien plant life that's being invited into our gardens, which then spreads out and causes havoc generally. Yeah. Um, what's what, what, how do you feel about that? Because I never really thought about it until Monday. Actually, I never really thought about the fact that it's almost unregulated in terms of, you know, what sort of things you can buy. Um, well, there's a list, there's a list of plants um, that you shouldn't, that um, the government recommends that you don't grow. Um, and that's been added to. So things like Japanese knotweed, which is now considered a very invasive plant, was introduced by the Victorians as, a, as an ornamental plant. Um, things like, you know, some species of cotoneaster, which is a really good bird plant, but because it's a really good bird plant, the birds disperse the seeds. And if you live in a rural area, then, then those seeds are likely to colonise um, uh, native habitats and, and outcompete um, native plants. I think the importance of native plants hasn't really been fully acknowledged, in, certainly in gardening circles, um, because I think people don't want to hear it. They don't want to, they don't want to know. They'd rather grow their sort of fancy ornamentals. Um, and from a nectar and pollen point of view, nectar and pollen is pretty much the same across the board. It doesn't matter 
what plant it's in. Um, there are some exceptions and, and some recent studies, and we are learning more all the time about this, but some recent studies have suggested that you actually get a greater diversity of pollinators visiting native plants than non-native plants. However, non-native plants extend the season of the pollinator for pollinators. So it, it's good to grow a mix. Um, but um, I think for caterpillars, I mean, I've got great tits, I can see them now at the window, I've got great tits nesting in my garden and I was watching them this morning and they, you know, I mean, one baby blue tit needs 100 caterpillars a day for like three weeks. You've got 10 in the nest, that's a thousand caterpillars a day. Um, and I'm assuming it's the same for great tits. Um, I was watching the great tits this morning and they were getting the caterpillars from my garden and my garden's 40 foot long. It's a, you know, it's a really, by, compar by comparison to, to a lot of gardens across the country, it's a very small garden, but because I've grown mostly native shrubs and trees or all native shrubs and trees, um, I've got a lot of caterpillars, I've got a lot of leaf miners, I've got a lot of aphids um, and all of those things that have an existing relationship with the plants. Non-native plants do attract um, leaf munching insects, but just not in the numbers that the native plants do because the native plants have just literally been here longer and, and have had longer to establish the relationship with those insects. Interesting with blue tits actually because um, the research shows that blue tits living in urban areas are actually doing less well than yeah. our woodland counterparts because they can't find the caterpillars. Yeah, so if all of us in urban areas grow native plants then happy days for the blue tits, I mean they'll be well away. Um, and that's, that's, yeah, I focus quite a lot of my time and energy on trying to encourage people to do that. Well, that's good. What, what about Budlia? Budlia is an interesting thing. I don't know too much about it. Can, can, what is it? Um, is so Bud Budlia Budley is, Budley is a Chinese shrub that was introduced again by the Victorians. Um, it has these big, long sort of plate-like flowers um, and seems to be a very good nectar plant. Um, and it flowers quite late in the season. So um, butterflies, so particularly butterflies um, that sort of emerge in sort of July, August, they um, feed from the flowers. Um, there are lots of other good nectar plants as well. Um, and then I think two species of moth also lay eggs on the leaves. Budley is one of those that I think is so ubiquitous that some of our native species of moth have, have, have started to use it as a, as a caterpillar food plant as well. So it does have, it does have a dual purpose there. Good. Um, to the fellow Zoomers watching all of this, you're all very quiet. I just wondered if anyone had a question for Kate at this point. I have a question. Uh, Hi, Jo. Actually, <laughs> This is Ronique. Ronique, sorry. Ronique, Ronique changes her name every time she comes on. I do. Oh. I, like, I like to keep you guys on the, on your toes. Okay. Hi, Ronique. Um, I, I live in a, hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, thank you. I live in uh, Seattle, Washington in the United States on the West okay. Coast. Okay, cool. And um, I live in a condo in a very urban area of Seattle. Lots of cars. Um, I live right off a major highway. And um, our garden of the condo was um, completely overrun with English ivy, which is invasive here. Yeah, and yeah. Spread by, spread by birds because they love the berry. <laughs> um, so it's a big problem here. So I uh, pitched to my condo board to um, have a budget uh, to re get it removed and then um, turn the garden into a certified wildlife habitat. Oh, nice. So um, the English ivy is gone. Uh, it's two years now. We've started planting native plants two years ago, and I maintain the whole garden. And I don't, let the, I don't let the landscapers do any leaf blowing or good. weed whacking. Oh, good. <laughs> they, want, they want to clean it so much. And I'm like, leave it oh. messy. Please. You know? So oh, I got good. hermit thrushes uh, to the yard recently because the garden is so messy, which is awesome. So that wow. was good. Um, but I was wondering, do you guys have anything in, um, in Britain, do you have anything similar to a certified wildlife habitat designation that for here you can get it through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and it's an actual sign you can get for your yard and there's five things that you do. You remove invasive plants, plant natives, you put in food for birds, a uh, water source and a nest box and then that's it and you you can have the designation do you have something like that uh, where you live no we don't we don't have anything official unfortunately um i mean there are the, we have nature reserves um but yeah you can't i mean you can 
just say my garden's dedicated for wildlife but yeah you don't get you don't get certification which is sad really i think that would be a really nice thing to do and here they also have a uh, certified pollination gardens as well um oh, you know cool. for butterflies and bees and and there's nothing like that yeah um, no that would be really good yeah because then yeah. people living in the city could have that designation and it's a actually it's a really great selling point for a condo or a house you know yeah, to, yeah. To have that. yeah. that's actually how i pitched yeah. it to my condo. <laughs> okay so, Maybe okay. I should pitch it, pitch it to someone. Yeah, good yeah. idea. Thanks. Yeah. In the UK, we have a more generic um, sort of uh, thing, which is called a, science, a, science, a special scientific interest, triple SI. Mm. But you have to jump through about 100 hoops to, to get that. And, it's for, and you couldn't make your garden an SI, could you? <laughs> no, you couldn't make a garden. Unless something really rare was, was breeding on your garden, in your garden. Yeah. It's got to be a, a larger area. Mm. I think that's a great oh, idea. I like that idea. I really like that idea. Thanks, Ronique. Anyone else? <laughs> okay. Okay, no one else said. Um I have another question actually. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm curious I'm curious how David introduced you as the first butterfly ambassador. Yeah, I was the first garden ambassador for Butterfly Conservation Trust. Um so yeah, they 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 they've got several ambassadors, but I'm I'm the I was the first garden one. Um, so what does that entail? Planting does that entail planting your garden for butterflies? Um, well, I'll do that anyway. I think I because I write for them. I think I, uh, yeah, they they they've taken me on as as an ambassador. Um, and I think yeah, I I don't know. I say nice things about butterfly conservation and um, nice. uh, yeah, I tweet things for them, and I don't know. It's a sort of mutual relationship, really, where we, we we do nice things for each other, and yeah, it's good. Great, thank you. Okay, hey, there's a question. Thank you, by the way, Ronique. There's a question from Oni. Oni. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm Hi. struggling. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Oni. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, as you were speaking about native species, we have all these mm. fabulous, well, I'm, I'm in France, actually, in southwest France, but I remember in oh, the nice. UK, you've got all these amazing garden shows, Tatton, yeah. Chelsea. Are they part of the problem for yeah. um, this, <laughs> this actual fever for the exotic and the amazing and the unusual? I think they have been in the past. Um, I think there's a huge move um uh, and flower shows um for them to be more sustainable and for the are you still there uh the chelsea flower show every other garden had loads of wildflowers and it was really refreshing to see um you know um, showing different different ways of planting um work really well in pots and obviously just let them flower um, and if you let them flower, then then you know you're going to get the bees. So things like lavender and rosemary and oregano. Oregano is such an amazing butterfly plant if you let it flower. Um, and mint as well. Very few people let mint flower, and it's brilliant, it's an amazing plant. Um, and some of those um, are really good for caterpillars as well. So again, in a small space, um, you know, growing growing these things, you know, you, you get pollinators visiting the um, flowers, and then you get um, moths laying eggs on the leaves as well. Um, and not all gardeners welcome caterpillars eating the leaves, especially of, oh hi, um, especially um, of, of edible herbs. But um, I, you know, I think it's fine to share. I like to share. Um, and I'd rather have the wildlife there than, you know, not have the wildlife there. Okay. Um, I, I dropped off. I'm not asleep, but unfortunately <laughs> you dropped me out of the conversation, so I don't know what I've missed. Um, I trust that I only got to ask a question as well, yeah? Yes. Good. Um, Can I ask a Galaxy question? Tab 6, uh, sorry, S2 has a question. <laughs> Hi. Oh, that's me. Sorry, yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> what a variety of Cotoni Aster. Sorry, I don't know why my name didn't come up. Fiona is my name. Um, Hiya. Hiya, great to talk to you. Um, just what variety of Cotone Aster? Are all the Cotone Asters bad? No, it's not all of them. Um, there's a list. If you, go onto the, if you go onto the RHS website, they've got a list. Um, and I think, 
I think there's some confusion as to whether the Cor Cortonias the horizontalis is one of them, because that's that's the one that everyone grows in the gardens. So that's the lovely it's one with herring bird. It's great for the yeah. bee, but again, yeah, that's, that's what's so good. The bees love it, the birds love it, and so it disperses. But I think if you live in a city, it's not as important. But if you live in if you live in the country, then yeah, it can it can um, it can yeah. sort of go out. Um, so yeah, off the top of my head, there's there's a few cotoniasters and uh the rhs has got a list on the website okay okay yeah and would Fichelia and barrage be okay oh yeah yeah, yeah. brilliant bee plants amazing yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah where do you get a list of of native plants um how do you know what a native plant is right well if you want native shrubs and trees so if you just if you google caterpillar food plants then oh, Butterfly cool. Conservation has a list. Um, it's actually on its Moth Count website, I think. But if you, mm -hmm. if you Google butter, um, Caterpillar Food Plants, then um, it, it gives you a list of Caterpillar Food Plants, which are all native. So it starts with trees and shrubs, and then gives you a few herbaceous plants, and then things like grasses and, and weeds, like dandelions and docks and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and native flowers... I mean... <laughs> Yeah, there's wildflower books and things like that. I think, yeah, I think, I think a good list of native plants would be would be something to uh, to include in my next book, maybe. Um, yeah, I can't think. I can't think of the top of my head. I mean, if it's something like um, a, a rosy bee plant, um, who is a very small outfit that sells bee friendly plants. I think she writes whether they're native or not in her list. Uh -huh. And she's done loads of studies on what the bees like, and she's got these really amazing um, sort of lists of things that attract honeybees and solitary bees and bumblebees. And like a lot um, of the salvias do, but I presume they're not native. They're not native, um, and they've been bred to sort of, you know, a lot of the bred and hybridised and all of those things, but they're still really good nectar plants, the bees. I mean, that's the thing is that a lot of non-natives are really good nectar plants. So in my garden, I grow native shrubs and trees for invertebrates generally for the moths and the leaf miners and the, the leaf munchers yeah um, and then I grow, um, a mixture of native and non-native nectar plants mm. um so that you've got something in flower from sort of february right up until december really almost 12 months of the year um mm. and i mean uh, perennial wallflower is a really good one to grow um because it flowers well in brighton it flowers pretty much every day of the year oh okay great great yeah and uh, our, sorry, Tom, just no, one other no, no. last question. Just, I wanted to get a, um, a hedgehog uh, little house. How do you stop the cats going into a hedgehog house? Um, if you if you buy a hedgehog house, then the, the they've got um, you a can't a cat a cat couldn't a cat couldn't get in because um, well the, my design has got a tunnel that goes oh. in and then the hedgehog has to go round round yeah get into the box so yeah. a cat. A cat couldn't even put its put its arm in its arm that would its be front leg, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So some hedgehog houses are better than others. I'm just trying to think. Yeah, I've seen some with no tunnel. They just have an yeah, opening. Yeah, you need to have a tunnel. Well, yeah. some 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 of the openings, if you actually look, they've got the internal tunnel, and I think that's better because yeah. it's just a more of a compact, um, mm. a compact box. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, uh, get one, get, yeah, the best one, I can't remember, it might be Wildlife World or something like that, but um, it's got a, re yeah, it's got an internal tunnel and it's really easy to clean. Great. Um, and it was about 50 quid or something like that. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thanks. But yeah, I, I can't remember exactly where it's from. Uh -huh. Thank you. All right. Can you still see me, by the way? Yeah. Because my, my whole thing's gone haywire, but Thea, oh, you're back again, oh, Thea. Yeah. Are you from Ireland, by the way? Are you actually ringing yeah, from Dublin? Dublin, oh, yeah. Oh, hi. Yeah. I ticked you off about uh, not giving Kate a proper... Um, ad oh, sorry. <laughs> Advert. <laughs> I, I didn't plug you well enough, Kate, yesterday. Oh, Monday. okay. So I got severely reprimanded. And I, my head is bad. Oh, thank you, Thea. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, any more questions, by the way? Because we want a bit of a roll here. That's <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, shrubs and things like just what, yeah. what kind of shrubs would you say? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, shrubs. So, I've, what have I got? I've got um, 
uh, a really small tree actually is the Kilmarnock willow which is a it's basically a goat willow um, which has been yeah. grafted onto something else yes so it's, I know it. it's technically mm. not native but it sort of is um, it's basically a native plant that's been played with but it's do you know what it's small it's compact it's really good for small gardens and um, a number of um, sort of moths that breed on sallows and willows will breed on it um, and then you get the catkins in spring as well which mm. the bees uh, go mad for um, um, and it's quite when you say so, sorry to interrupt you when you say small I put in a, a, a birch a, a betula pendula tristus and it's grown to be about oh I don't know 30, 40 feet, 30 and meters, yeah. far too big for the garden. It's lifting the whole, like it's just going to knock the walls down and the neighbours go mad. Wow. So we we'll have to take it out. How big okay. is Kilmarnock? Kilmarnock Willow, it, it can't, because it's grafted, it can't grow taller than it is when you yeah. buy it. It can grow wider, but it's like a little, you've got to be careful when you're pruning them because otherwise you can prune them really badly and make them look like weird umbrellas. Oh, yeah, I know. Um, those yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it can't grow much taller. So I'm just looking at mine now and it's, it's, it's shorter than I am and it will always be shorter than I am. And I'm five, seven and a half. Yeah. So it's about five foot tall. It's, it's really small. It's a shrub, really. I want something that would go, would go like that would be suitable for a perch for the feeders, you know, for the bird feeders. Oh, OK. I mean, I've got a little feeder under it, actually. Um, and the tits love it. They, they, they sort of go down into it and then they and then they um, they uh, they feed from it. And um, yeah, when the peregrines fly over as well, they, they just go and hide in there. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> you're, just, you're just boasting now, peregrines. <laughs> OK. <laughs> We've Lovely, all got peregrines. Oh, no, we don't. <laughs> yeah, so shrubs-wise then? Oh. Shrubs, so hazel. I mean, hazel grows into a tree, but it grows into quite a small tree. But I think hazel's really attractive. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really good for insects, really good for caterpillars. Uh, what else have I got? Gelder rose is really lovely. Um, uh, nice flowers in spring and then berries in autumn. Yeah. Um, European spindle. spindle. Really nice. Um, holly, can't go wrong with a holly. Um, Big. Mm. They uh, no, but they grow so slowly. So um, get a small one. I've, I've just planted planning. a holly that's that big. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never see it get to a tree. Um, yeah. What else? Uh, hawthorn. It makes a really good small tree. I mean, hawthorn will grow to about fifteen meters eventually. Um, right. But it's yeah. you know it's nice. It's a small garden, very small. <laughs> very yeah. small. Well, you know, my garden's 40 foot and I've got, at the back, I've got Hawthorne, Silver Birch, Rowan, and then I've got the sort of shrubs in front, in front of that. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think there's always room for more shrubs and trees than we think there are. Oh, I've stuffed it in all right, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we were talking earlier, Kate, about... Um, planting for caterpillars have we have we covered that because i know i missed part of this uh, conversation uh, i think i've touched on it but i can i can go into more detail yeah it'd be interesting um i think the thing is you know as i said you know blue tits uh, great tits they all all most most garden birds feed caterpillars to their young caterpillars aphids um little leaf miners other little leaf munching grubs and i think as as wildlife gardeners um the most important thing we can do is to grow the plants that bring those caterpillars in, bring those leaf miners and leaf munchers and, and other little things in, um, so that the birds have got something to feed their young. And it's not just birds, it's, it's hedgehogs. Hedgehogs, everyone thinks hedgehogs eat slugs and snails, but they largely eat beetles and caterpillars. Um, uh, well, frogs and toads, they, they sometimes eat caterpillars as well. Even little field mice eat caterpillars. Um, and they're just to the bottom of the food chain and so and so for me pl growing plants that bring in those caterpillars is really important and it is the native so it is you know the caterpillar food plant so as i said um to the sort of googling um caterpillar food plants will, will come up with a list of um native native plants in in the uk um if you get it i think it's on the moths count or the butterfly conservation website there's a really good list there um so yeah things like hawthorn hazel birch um, if you've got a large garden, then oak, obviously, um, ivy, you know, I think covering your fences and walls with climbers is really important. If you can get ivy, then brilliant. Uh, ivy's got a really bad reputation um, for knocking down walls, but um, 
there's been research that says this is actually if you've got an, if you've got existing holes in the walls or the fence then ivy will take advantage of them but if you put if you grow ivy up a new wall then ivy actually protects it um, that's the research that's 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 sort of come through in recent years about that um, i grow ivy up my fences um, and that provides shelter for birds but it also provides um, habitat for those that that lay eggs on it and 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 the, and the larvae that eat it um, and i think it's worth remembering that in the UK, um, which I imagine stretches to the British Isles, so uh, Ireland included, there's two and a half thousand species of moth, um, and they, um, they, they all. Some of them are very generalised and will feed on a number of different plants. And when I say feed, I mean lay eggs on. But some of them are very specialised; will only feed on one or two plants, um, and they're not all natives really. Um, and so the more native plants, the more caterpillar feed plants you grow, the more moths you get laying eggs, and so the greater abundance of caterpillars you have in the garden. And that means caterpillars of all different sizes, because when the birds are feeding very young chicks, they feed them caterpillars that are that big, and then when the chicks get bigger, they, you know, the caterpillars get bigger. And then it means you have caterpillars for longer in the year as well. So, you know, they, they, they come out earlier, and you get different species breeding at different times of year. So, so there's always a supply of food in the garden, and that's really important. What about if you have, I mean, when I lived in London in Notting Hill, I, I lived in my mate's house and he basically had a concrete garden, concrete, mm. not hardly a lick of green, even though I did discover 55 different species of bird over the 10 years mm. I was there. But what would you suggest for people who feel that all is lost? I um, just grow stuff in pots. I mean, you, you know, you can do quite a lot with concrete um, and it doesn't have to be, they don't have to be expensive pots. You can grow stuff in old tubs, you, can, you know, just stick a hole in a bucket. Um, I mean, builders are always throwing out buckets and skips and things. Um, they never clean their buckets. They always throw their buckets away. I get really cross, but I, I scavenge skips for buckets that I grow things in on the allotment. Um, Cause half the time they've got cracks in the bottom anyway. So you don't need to add drainage holes um, and just grow stuff. Um, and you know you can grow stuff from seed you can grow stuff I mean gardeners are really generous you know they're always giving stuff away um, so you know uh, make friends with some gardeners you know make friends with your neighbours swap things over swap seeds swap plants um, it doesn't have to be an expensive process at all um, and you know just build up a collection of, of, of plants and greenery and add to the concrete. In fact, I'll give you an example. So um, guy I know who lives in Brighton um, is really obsessed with hedgehogs and his back garden is amazing. Um, and his front garden is all paved, but you can't tell because it's, it's just got pots everywhere. And last time I was there, there was a hedgehog, there were two hedgehogs sleeping under a pot of lavender. Really? Yeah, on a paved driveway in Portslade. So, you know, if, if you can create, you know, if he can create a hedgehog habitat in a paved front garden, then, then anyone can. And in terms of your gardening generally, in terms of advice you give people and stuff, do you go above street level and go onto roofs as well? Do you talk about roofs? Um, I don't, I don't specialise in roofs. I, yeah, it's not really my area. I don't know an awful lot about it. I mean, obviously, adding a green roof is brilliant because you're replacing the land that was lost by the building that the, the land is beneath you know what i mean um so it's really good I've, I've i have added green roofs to sheds before um so yeah i'd recommend it but i don't i wouldn't i'm not an expert but there's a guy called dusty isn't there dusty Gedge. Yeah, yeah. he's a green um, roof expert yeah um going back to what you are good at one thing is that you are a good presenter and you've had a few shots on uh, spring watch how's that been yeah it's good it's good so i transformed my garden last year um and i did it all on spring watch so um yeah i bought the house in january and started filming in march um sort of taking out all of these horrible non-native shrubs and, and replacing them with, with um, native trees and shrubs and laid a wildflower meadow and had Joel and his brother come and dig a pond, um, had bird boxes retrofitted into the cavity walls of the house, which is exciting. Um, so yeah, no, that was really good. Yeah. 
um, possibly doing an update for them this year, but um, don't know about that yet because um, they've been they've been having a nightmare with Corona and uh, all of that remote filming. Um, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, no, it was yeah, it was good. So I did spring watching Gardener's Dodd last year. Um, yeah, no, it's nice. Another question here for you, Lena. Oh yeah, just wildflower seeds, Kate. Oh yeah. Um, what ones do you recommend? Um, <sighs> type like. Are you, are you planting in a lawn or do you want sort of cornfield annuals? Small patch of, of earth. Small patch of earth. Um, I'd probably go for cornfield annuals then. Um, so oxide daisy mm -hmm. is really good. Mm -hmm. um, cornflowers, red poppies. Mm -hmm. um, you could grow a mixture of perennials and... Um, yeah annuals so greater nap weeds really nice i'm just thinking of things that are easy to grow from seeds because a lot of a lot of people scatter wildflower seed and then nothing comes up and they get really disappointed so i would probably i'd buy the seed packets separately mm. um not a mix i wouldn't buy a mix i just i just don't i just yeah i don't really think they they're very good <laughs> um, i'd buy them separately um so i'd go oxide daisy greater nap weed um red clover um and then i'd in some annuals so some cornflowers and some red poppies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh i think that would look nice yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and with the borage and then the virgilia yeah. and with the borage and the visit that would look lovely that would look really nice yeah please all love you um, and um, don't forget when the knapweed um, finishes flowering, um, then just leave it there because the goldfinches will come in. Oh and yes, I, yeah. I had goldfinches feeding from knapweed seed in my front garden, which is basically on the main road. So it was very nice. And they love the verbena. They take the seeds from the verbena banariensis, which again probably isn't a native, but yeah, uh, everything. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Mm -hmm. um, one other question for you, actually, Kate, is um, the thought of deterring, deterring cats and things. Um, mm. Can we use plants to do that? I mean, I've heard in terms of deterring cats, for example, to bury tea bags soaked in uh, mussel um, spray, you know, the um, massage spray stuff, it's pain relief. Oh, oh, really? Okay. And also the idea of planting holly around the foot of your um, bird table, which is on a post, um, so that cats can't sort of get around to jump up on it. Yeah, I mean, I think holly, holly was gonna be one of the things that, that I said. Uh, so if, you, you can, if you've got a big holly bush, then you can trim stems of holly and lay them around in, on bits of bare soil in the garden to uh, deter them from using your garden as a toilet. Um, and then, you know, yes, plant holly around uh, birds, uh, tables and things like that so that cats can't hide in them. Um, lion poo is supposed to be very good at deterring cats, it scares them. Oh, I've got one, I've got a lion around the corner, I can uh, borrow his poo then, yeah. Mm -hmm. But apparently you can buy lion poo from zoos. Can you? Yeah, you, you, can, you can actually buy lion poo from zoos to, uh, to scare the cats away. And um, uh, what's the other thing? Oh, you can get little water sprayer things. Um, that can be effective apparently. Well like timers that just come on every minute. Well not timers but they're they're motion activated oh. so that the cats get a little sort of jet of water. But then you know then you're sort of straying into the is it ethical sort of territory, aren't you? Um and it would also it would also hit foxes, wouldn't it? And small children. Um and hedgehogs possibly. And possibly hedgehogs, yeah. So I don't know how yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, the cats are much, you know, discussed subject, obviously, because worldwide mm. they kill billions of birds. And it's just finding the best way to, to deter them without being cruel, you know. Yeah. I don't know if any of the Zoomers here have any ideas regarding um, cats, but sorry, mm. you're saying, Kate. <laughs> just looking at Fiona there. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't know. Um, I think. Actually, like the best thing is probably just education and just reminding people how lovely nature is. I mean, I know I know people who, who have cats 
and they say, oh, this will be my last cat because I just can't cope with the amount of wildlife they kill. Um, so I don't know. Maybe others, do you get others that say, this is my furry baby and it has every right to be out in the garden and you ain't yeah. tell me anything different. Yeah, it's nature. It's nature's way. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think we should all be putting bells on the cats as well. Um, I think that, yeah. I don't know. Or buy a three-legged cat. I've got a friend who had a, who's got, had a three-legged cat, couldn't catch anything. Um, so maybe that's the way forward. I was going to say, I've, I've got um, cats are a complete nightmare in my garden. Oh. Uh, everyone else's cats, because I don't have a cat, but yeah, all the other cats seem cat. to use my garden as a toilet. Oh. Yeah. Um, I think get a dog, and I get found, a little yappy yeah. dog. <laughs> well, my neighbour's got one of those as well, drives me oh. nuts is a mix of uh, they don't like peppermint and they don't like citronella so okay. occasionally i'll mix that up in a water bottle and spray it around either the areas they're getting in where they're doing their business or on the beds anytime i clear a patch of earth before i want to plant something they'll be in there doing their business uh, as well okay. as on the lawn and everywhere else in coffee grounds i sprinkle those around liberally again i think anything okay. that's smelly yeah can dissuade them mm. Fascinating. So we covered quite a, a whole range of subjects on the, uh, the gardening front. Anyone else out there have any gardening queries? Because now is the time. It's now or never, guys. Any Zoomers um, with any questions? Yes, me. I'd like to. Um, Kate, what do you... Uh, snails, since I've been... Yeah. have been my bugbear. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got... I don't know where hostas come from, probably Japan or somewhere, but they're literally like filigree lace now because they've been so decimated. But I've noticed now that the snails that I've got here, they're going on my clematis, they're going on the lilies, they go literally everywhere. And I do want mm. to be, you know, wildlife friendly, but then when you put all this effort in and, and literally everything yeah. is decimated by this one creature, what do you do? Uh, what do you do? Um, well, there's a lot of things you can do. I mean, I think the most effective thing is um, to go out every night um, and spend half an hour just picking them off and putting them in a bucket. And then if you want to kill them, then kill them. Um, or you can take them on holiday. Like, so, to you know, if you've got like a... a I used to take things to the park until I met a park warden who was really upset about the fact that I took them to the park. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. Um, so at the moment I've got a couple of lupins and I don't really grow lupins because of the snails. The snails like them so much, but I put a few in just being, I don't know, wistful about lupins. Um, but yeah, I've got them both growing under pint glasses at the moment um, because snails were eating all of them and they've just been reduced to these tiny leaves. Um, and I take them off and I just throw them. Uh, I've got an alleyway, so I've got, I throw them down the end of the alleyway and they always come back, but I just figure if they've, if they've got to spend all night coming back, then that gives the lupins half a night to uh to, to grow back um i mean you know i don't use slug pellets um because well the metal i can never say metallohyde metaldehyde metaldehyde um it's poisonous to hedgehogs um that was banned briefly but then the ban was overturned um and then I'm just so about to try some crushed eggshells i don't know if that's going to do any good you but... can, yeah um I think the thing, I think that all, all those things, so Claire was saying, um, you know, the garlic spray on the hostas, the crushed egg cells, the coffee you can deter them as well. Um, mm. le the thing that I found really effective is, is, is laying down brambles. So you get brambles and you, and you cut the bramble stems into little sticks and then you literally put the brambles, you make a wall of little bramble stems around the plants and the snails don't like climbing over that. No, um, that's good. But with the, with the garlic and with the coffee and with the eggshells, you've, you've just got to do it all the time. So whenever it rains, you've got to go back and spray it on again. Or you've got to, you know, have quite a, a deep layer of, of crushed eggshells. Because if you, do it, so if, if you don't do it liberally, then, then, then they, you know, they'll just find ways to get 
get to your plants anyway. I mean, I've seen I've seen snails climb up um, climb up a chair leg and climb over onto the chair and then literally just drop themselves down onto a plant. So if you've got like something around the plants, um, then they will find a way to drop in on the plant as well. Um, it's funny about uh, the snail speed because I remember when I lived in Notting Hill, my mates was quite a kind of you know very fussy about having things coming to the house that shouldn't be in the house. I remember once leaving the French doors open that led onto the garden and I walked into his, into his lounge or heavy and there was a cat in the lounge and he was saying, how long has that cat been there? Because he has allergies. And I said, oh, I just must have just walked in. But then I was let down because there was a snail on the French window and it's climbed all the way up. So it must have been there for about four hours. <laughs> you <know>? oh. <laughs> Busted by the snail. Yeah. But I've got another friend also um, who had snail problems in his garden and he decided to assassinate all the snails he could possibly, possibly come across. He spent hours every day just killing them. Um, mm. And I thought that was really barbaric and I didn't really like the idea of that. And they never went away because, you know, as soon as he killed them all, yeah. he wanted to turn up. Yeah. Um, I think... I think chickens are really good. We we'll get some chickens because um, um, they eat everything. But then you know they eat all the caterpillars as well. Um, and if you can create habitats for song thrushes, um, then song thrushes eat a lot of snails. Um, some larger frogs will eat smaller snails. Um, slow worms, they love a slug and a small snail. Grass snakes will eat small snails. Mm. So I think wildlife gardening is the answer. Um, I'm not sure I've quite got there yet, but you know, maybe, maybe one day we'll all have these perfect habitats where everything sort of works, yeah. works with everything else and, and we don't have these huge infestation of slugs and snails. Yeah, and for our American um, uh, viewers, listeners, whatever, a song thrush um, type of thrush, oh. really, but it's quite interesting because they are famous for getting hold of snails and whacking them on the stone until the shell breaks so they can actually eat the snail. But you know what? I have very rarely seen that these days. Really? Song crushes do that. I've seen song crushes all the time. I've not seen yeah. them for years. Ah, interesting. I do find snail shells on the allotment. Um, so I don't know. I hope it's a song thrush. But I mean, well, I don't see song thrushes that much these days. I mean, they're declining, aren't they, in parts exactly, of the UK? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, Kate, what's what's in the future for you? I mean, what's your kind of long-term plan? Long-term plan? Oh, I don't know. Um, I've just, yeah, I'm just been commissioned to write a new book on trees, which is nice. Um, so I'll be working on that. Trees to plant in your garden, so small trees, wildlife-friendly trees. Um, yeah, I don't know what's in the long term. I think just getting through lockdown at the moment is my short term plan. How, how um, have you been for your lockdown? How, how have you found lockdown? Has gardening been your saviour? Yeah, I mean, I've been very busy with work. Um, so I haven't been able to do as much gardening as I've wanted to. But yeah, weekends have been sort of largely, largely gardening, which has been nice. My allotments never looked better. Um, um, yeah, and I mean, it's, you know, we've got quite a light lockdown compared to what you've got, as we were talking about earlier. Um, but yeah, I think we're in week six now or five, starting to starting to do me in a bit. Um, but yeah, I think getting out of that would be good. I'm doing some filming for Gardeners World in a couple of weeks and I've got to film it myself, which will be <laughs> very interesting. Uh, yes. Yeah, I've had a similar thing. Uh, Surrey Wildlife Trust asked me to film um, something for their Go World in June thing that they do. And the list I got, can I have a wide shot of this and a close up? <laughs> and I, I said, I've only got a phone. And yeah. I've only got me. <laughs> yeah, I sold my camera about two weeks before lockdown on eBay. So brilliant. Well done, Kate. I had a really nice Canon 5D shot, shooting in high um, HD, all of that, all the, all the, all the zoomy things, lenses and didn't use it so sold it and now should have kept it what advice would you give people in lockdown i know it's been a while now but what advice would you give them in terms of getting out in the garden and doing stuff um so, you know i think um 
I think don't forget to stop and learn and look and listen to what's going on. I think a lot, a lot of people have been learning birdsong um, during lockdown, which has been really nice. Um, I think um, planting habitat, like planting flowers for bees, planting food for caterpillars is really nice. Loads of people have been digging ponds, uh, like an amazing amount of people have been digging ponds, which is lovely. Um, I think one word of caution um, is not to do too much. So if you've got like, you know, a big pile of whatever in the corner that you've been meaning to tackle for years and now's your chance to tackle that pile of, of, of rubbish, you know, just bear in mind it's hedgehog nesting season. I've seen quite a few, I've seen quite a few reports um, sort of on social media of hedgehog rescues saying, you know, we've got another nesting female that's been, that's been disturbed because people are um, over tidying their gardens. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's something to be a bit cautious about. Um, and, but yeah, enjoy it, get out there, enjoy it. There's, you know, this is our opportunity to actually look and listen and, and, you know, enjoy the, the wildlife that's coming into our gardens. And, um, yeah, I, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of just sitting down and, and have, having a look and seeing what's going on. Yeah. And that's the thing, actually, just touching that. It's the fact that people feel they have to tidy up the whole time. You know, I speak to people who say I'm doing gardening and one person I spoke to, she said, yeah, I just, I just, you know, I had a hedge, I trimmed it. Um, what and i saw the picture she decimated it and yeah. that's a breeding habitat not just for birds but you know other invertebrates and other animals oh there's yeah. nothing in it so when i when i cut it there's nothing there and there's plenty of it elsewhere and that's the thing people think that they can cut their hedge down yeah and then trim their bushes back to nothing at this time of year but it's fine because there's other other habitat elsewhere they don't realize that what they've got is actually a very important element you know of what's out yeah. there yeah yeah <sighs> yeah <laughs> anyway, on that note <laughs> i think we should uh, brighten up a little bit now um any final questions guys oh hi dave i was just to say thank you kay oh because you you solved two problems. One, I, I live in a, what used to be a farm labourer's cottage on oh, wow. the farm. So oh, it's, wow. it's, all, it's all open in the farmyard and everything else. Yeah. There's no fences, no boundaries or anything. Oh, amazing. So everything I try and grow, yeah. they're free range chickens eat. Ah. And so I'm going to scavenge uh, buckets. Yeah. And grow stuff higher. Instead of planting into the soil, I'll I'll sow in plant into buckets. Okay. And I'll train the chickens to eat snails. To eat the snails. Brilliant. Good. Perfect. Well, thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, okay, I think the final questions I like to ask you, Kate. Are oh yes. That I ask everyone that participates on this uh, in conservation with series. And simple questions. What's your favourite bird, Kate? I think it's got to be the Swifts. I just love them so much, and because they've just come back this week as well, and oh, they just make me so happy. So yeah, Swift. And what's your favourite mammal? Hedgehog. Hedgehog. What's your favourite invertebrate? I'm going to say red-tailed bumblebee because that's my favourite bumblebee. Um, mm, yeah. I would but bees generally. I would have been disappointed if you hadn't said a bumblebee. <laughs> Amphibian. Toad. Common toad. Love him. Reptile. Slow worm. <laughs> Plant. Oh gosh. That's a hard one. Do you know what? I'm going to say Hawthorne because it's just amazing. I love it. I love everything about Hawthorne. Yeah. That's good. And the final question, which I didn't brief you on. If you were to be anywhere on this planet, notwithstanding COVID-19, where would you be right now? I'd be in the Ossa Peninsula in Costa Rica. Wow. Mm, amazing. Amazing, like the water is just like getting in a bath, and um, 
and the jungle is just so pristine. Very few people could go there. Howl of monkeys galore. Um, and they get humpback whales as well in July. I'm going to go back one July and see the humpback whales and swim in the bath like water and walk in the jungle. Fantastic. Okay, for those um, Zoomers listening in and watching, just to let you know that up and coming tomorrow, we've got a guy whose name I cannot pronounce. He's actually Hungarian. He's told me that for short, I can call him Sabi. Um, but his name is Shabolks Kolkai. He's an amazing artist, watercolour artist. He's actually going to be painting live on the, uh, the session because he has the commission and he's going to be teaching us how to use um, or to paint watercolours. Uh, on Friday, we've got a young 14-year-old kid called um, Kabir Kaur. I suppose 14 is young. So, yeah, a 14-year-old called Kabir Kaur. He's um, from London and he's really, really passionate about promoting wildlife uh, amongst Londoners. So uh, he's going to be on talking about his passion. On Saturday, we got the, uh, the chair of English nature, Tony Juniper. Uh, he's a really interesting guy, yeah, very contentious in terms of who he works for. And recently, the English nature people have decided to allow peregrines to be taken from the wild for falconry. So that's one subject we'll be definitely discussing. On Sunday, we've got another artist, but this artist is the man. He's, the, he's like the, the, the giant amongst um, uh, wildlife artists or bird artists. His name is Lars Johnson. He's about eight foot tall. He's from Sweden. And he'll be painting and talking as well about his work. He's done some amazing stuff. And if you're a birdie, you probably have a book somewhere that has his paintings. And on Monday the 11th, um, I have my good friend Jonathan Mayrav. He's an Israeli. And he'll be talking about um, the um, charity event that he puts on every year. Unfortunately, it was cancelled this year because of COVID-19. And that's uh, called Champions of the Flyway. Um, it's a, a race where people, groups of people join together in teams and try and see as many birds as possible in 24 hours, um, radiating out from Ilat into the Negev Desert. So it's a fantastic um, cause for charity. And you'll also be talking about birding in Israel. So that's coming up over the next few days and I hope to see you guys on one or two of them. I'd like to thank Kate. Kate, thank you so much for last oh, thank you for having me and, and, and doing this. It's been really amazing. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been lovely. Good. And thanks everyone for coming. Good. And uh, hopefully we'll have you again. <laughs> yeah. All right then, so sorry about the, well, I dropped off. I don't know if anyone else had any problems, but I had a problem. But um, I'll see you all soon. Take care, be safe, and keep on looking up. Take it easy. Yeah. Bye. Bye.